Let's turn this piece of yard waste into a beautiful bowl. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. Today we're going to turn this piece of yard waste into a gorgeous small bowl. Now, you might be thinking yard waste, well what are you talking about? Well, this was a bush. Now, this was an older limb from the bush. You can see there's many years of growth on there. This wood has some great potential. And the cool thing was, this wasn't a full-grown tree. This is a bush. And the biggest thing I want you to think about is, look at what's available around you. In your commutes to and from work or in your travels, pay attention to older neighborhoods. Older neighborhoods that have been around for several decades usually have mature trees and bushes in them. And many times there's tree crews that come through and they'll do some trimming and that. And you may see some small limbs in the ditch. Those limbs could be gold. Because a lot of times people have species of bushes or trees in their yard that are unusual are completely different than the typical trees that you find around in your particular location. So you'll never know what you'll come up with unless you give it a try. And the other thing to keep in mind is pretty much anything can be turned on the lathe. Now, there are many different tree species that aren't so great for turning on the lathe. Ones that are softer or have a ton of moisture in them initially, those may not be so great to turn, but you can turn almost anything on the lathe. So let's take this piece and let's go make a beautiful, probably a natural edge bowl. This does have bark on it. It has a very thin bark layer here, but there's a little separation going on here. And I'm thinking we're probably going to lose some of that bark. So if we have the bark on, that's live edge. If the bark comes off, then it's a natural edge, just a technical thing. So we're going to go ahead and get started on this and let's see what we come up with. Since we're working with such a small piece here, I want to take my time and find the center of this and mark that very precisely. If I'm off just a little bit one way or the other, I'm going to lose a big portion of this piece of wood. And since the piece is relatively small, I don't want to lose any. So I want to keep this as centered as possible. And I'm going to go ahead and mark the centers on both sides. And I'm mounting this between centers with the flat side towards the tailstock. That's going to be the base because we want this to be a live or natural edge bowl. Now, the reason I mount this between centers like this is so that I can precisely balance out the two top points of the bowl. And I do that simply by rotating it and marking. It's a little difficult with my thumb, so I'm going to bring a pencil in here. I'm looking at the line between the bark and the top of the wood. And I want that to be this in the same location on both sides. And it's not quite there. So what I do is loosen the tailstock and then bring it back in. And then I'll check it again to make sure they're both lined up. And that's looking real good. Once they're lined up, I'll tighten the tailstock. And as you might have noticed, this is not round. I did not round this in the bandsaw. I'm gonna be trimming this up on the lathe. It's such a small piece, there's no sense of bringing this to the bandsaw. And you also run the risk of taking off a little bit too much on the bandsaw. Here on the lathe, I can quickly round out those corners and make this piece look really nice very quick. So I'm using my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. If you watch any of my videos, you could probably repeat that line. <laughs> this is my go to gouge this in my 5 8 inch which is my roughing gouge this piece is so small that i'm going to use it for the entire bowl i'm going to use my half inch gouge not my large gouge if you saw there the piece came to a stop and that's because the tailstock needed to be tightened up also once those corners are off it's a good idea to move the tool rest up Okay, so the first cuts that I'm doing are going to be designed to remove material, basically rough out the shape of this bowl. And you can see I'm moving from right to left, and I need to tighten that tailstock. And I'm using the left side of the gouge by tilting the gouge to the left. If the flute of the gouge is pointing straight up equals 12 o'clock, 
then when I'm making the previous cut, I'm positioning it at about the 1030 position. Now I'm gonna flatten out the base of this bowl and I take the gouge and bring it in the other direction, which is gonna be at about the 130 location. I'm gonna make a few light passes and even out this surface on the bottom of the bowl. Now, I wasn't concerned with that bottom being even or rotating even because what's more important with a live edge or natural edge bowl is to have the top portion of the bowl balanced the way you want. In this case, I wanted both of the top portions of the wings to be balanced with one another. You can see this still needs a little bit more material removed, so I'm just going to make a light cut across here. And I'm going to be making a tenon for this. Now, I'm, I'm often asked, why don't I make mortises or recessed areas to grip this bowl? And quite honestly, I don't feel I can do design justice for the bowl when I create a mortise or recess. It's difficult to shape the final foot of the bowl if I have a negative space there. Once I take that material away, it's... I can't put it back in there. If I'm using a tenon and a shoulder, I have material to work with that I can shape into the foot of the bowl. And that's primarily why I use tenons. And a small bowl like this is a great example. It would be very difficult, if, although not impossible, but it would be difficult to create a nice foot and have this be held on the lathe with a recessed connection. So what I'm doing is I'm rough shaping the foot, or I'm rather the tenon and the shoulder. These will become the foot eventually. Now I'm switching to my 3 8 inch spindle detail gouge. This is going to allow me to put a really nice crisp dovetail angle on the inside of that tenon. This will match the angle of my four jaw chuck. Just want to take my time and make sure I've got a good clean bottom corner there so there's no debris in that the bottom of that tenon. I want the tenon to seat perfectly flat with the four jaw chuck both on the top of the jaws and on the inside of the jaws that are gripping it. Now I'm making this tenon relatively small and I realized there's an area I didn't clean up. It's a real thin there. So that's not enough to get a really good secure support. So I'm gonna actually create the um, depth of the tenon a little bit deeper, which is no big deal. I come back in with my half inch bowl gouge and remove a little bit of the shoulder area. And then I come back in with my detailed spindle gouge and I'll continue that dovetail angle a little bit deeper so the tenons got a little bit more material for the jaws to grab. I needed to speed the lathe up there. It was kind of an interesting little illusion here. I sped the lathe up, but because of the frame rate of the camera and the lights and the speed of the lathe, it looks like the lathe slowed down. It's actually going faster now than it was just a moment ago. Here you can see I'm cleaning up that inside corner of the bottom of the tenon to make sure that it's there's no debris or any uncut areas there. Okay, that's looking really good. Now, we've established the base of the bowl. We need to start creating the curve that's going to go up to the top of the wings of the bowl. So I'm just going to start making some push cuts from the base of the bowl up to the top to start shaping the curve. Now these cuts are being made rather quickly and when we make quick cut cuts they can leave a relatively rough surface. That's why we call this roughing. It's really not that big of a deal. We can do this quickly but we don't want that to be the final surface on the bowl. When we get down to the final surface, we'll put a smoother finishing cut on the surface so that we don't have big rough tool marks on the bowl. 
but the roughing cups to help us to shape this whole area very quickly. What I'm looking for design-wise is I'm looking to have a flowing curve that goes from the top of one wing across the bottom of the bowl and up to the opposite wing without any interruptions. In other words, I don't want the bowl to appear as if the, the bottom is flat necessarily or there's extra curves in the shape. I want one organic fluid flowing curve across the entire bottom or the entire exterior of this bowl. Now, I know you guys have heard me mention this before, but it is so true. Take your time working the exterior of the bowl. The exterior of the bowl is the bowl. You could fuss all you want working on the inside of the bowl, but you're not going to change the overall look of the bowl much by doing the interior. The exterior is what defines the design and shape of the entire bowl. So I'm really fussing here. And I'm primarily working on the bottom curve coming off the base of the bowl up to about the bottom third of the bowl at this point. Just want to get a nice smooth curve there. And that's going to give me a visual cue that I need to link into. Once I've established the shape of the base of the bowl, it'll be easier for me to link in these top wings. Now you can see the bottom of the bowl curving. And now I have to take the edge, the very top edge of this blank and merge it with that lower curve. Now you're going to see me doing something a little different here. I'm going against the supported grain cut. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm still attempting to maintain that bark on this bowl. If I were to cut in the opposite direction, I would be pushing the bark away from the wood and it's almost 100% guarantee that I'm going to remove that bark. Instead, if I cut gently in the direction I'm going from left to right, I have a better chance of maintaining that bark. I still have flat sides, but the bark is actually holding on, which is a really good sign. So I'm making very, very light cuts here and following the curve. And I'm visually lining up the area that I'm cutting with the curve below. I still have some flat spots there. They're almost even, which means that I measured this and found the center pretty well, which is the overall goal of that mounting it initially. If I had been off a little bit from the center, one side would be higher and I would have to keep cutting away material. Here, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the top of the bowl when I'm turning. I'm not looking at the tool. I'm looking at the top edge to see the shape that's being created. That's how I'm following the flow of this curve. If you focus in on the, on the tool itself, you're going to lose track of the overall shape of the bowl. It's kind of like riding a bicycle and staring at the pedals. You probably won't have a really good idea where you're headed if you're not looking forward. All right, we're getting very close. Just a little bit of flat spot there that needs to be removed. And the bark is still holding on. I can't believe it. Even with that light separation that's there, somehow this bark hasn't broken away. And there we go. We've got it. And you can actually see the separation still in the bark Okay, so here's the shape we have. We've got the bottom curve pretty much established. We have the top wings completely established. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm doing pull cuts to remove away the bulk of the material between those two points to connect this curve. And while I'm doing this, I am doing this in the grain supported direction. 
I'm being careful to stay away from those top wings so I don't accidentally damage the bark that I've taken so much care to maintain. Okay, this is looking good, except I've got this fat outside curve. And this is what I was talking about. I didn't want that in there. I want a smooth flowing curve from the top wing on one side to the wing on the other side. I'm going to deepen the shoulder just a bit. That's also going to allow me to be able to shape the foot the way I want when I'm done. So I'm going to continue with the pull cuts. I'm keeping the tool pressed firm onto the tool rest and up against my hip. And I'm just rotating my body weight like you may have seen me do in a previous video where I show you how to move while wood turning. The way we get nice smooth flowing curves is not by using our hands and arms. It's by simply making very refined movements by shifting our weight. That's it. Here you can see that hump that I had in the bowl is being removed and I've got more of the flowing curve that I'm looking for. I was focusing again on the base of the bowl up to the middle portion and now I have this higher portion. I need to merge those together. So I'm using a pull cut here. You see the shavings are a little bit wider. That's because I'm roughing out material. I'm not doing a refining shear scrape yet. I'm still taking off material. I've got this edge that's a little bit high and there's some tool marks there. That I need to take out with the shear scrape. So I'm going to turn the tool rest perpendicular to the cut. This is going to give me the most support with the bowl gouge. And very lightly I'm going to do a shear scrape. Now you want to be careful with this. Keep in mind we're never pressing the tool into the bowl because you're going to hit those wings especially with the live edge or natural edge bowl like this instead i'm pressing down into the tool rest and i'm focusing on making a curve sm a smooth curve movement that's it and then i'm engaging the tool with the bowl and that's i'm not pressing into the bowl at all and i just shave those edges down now i've got a video all about the shear scrape you're going to want to Check that out. If you haven't started using the shear scrape as your finishing cut on your bowls, you're going to want to check that out and you are going to love shear scraping because it does so much from such a very simple technique. Okay, so I'm going to sand this down. What I'm doing is I'm sanding down with the grain direction. Now, this is different than supported grain. It's just the surface grain. I want to sand with the grain. Now, here I'm getting down into the joint between the base of the of the bowl and the what will become the foot of the bowl and i'm doing that with the lathe on that's going to create scratch marks where it goes against the grain so what i do with the sanding pad on the sander is i'm using the edge of the pad to sand along with the grain of the wood and when you do that you're going to erase those scratch marks also, with the first grits here, I started with 120, I'm on 180 right now. I'm looking for any tool marks, because there will be tool marks when you're doing a natural edge or a live edge bowl. There's almost no way of getting around that. But you want to remove and erase those tool marks with either the 120 or the 180 grit sandpaper. So when you get to the higher grits, everything will be smooth and you won't see any tool marks. Okay, so with the exterior completed, the, the most difficult part, we're going to put the chuck on and we're going to go ahead and work on the inside. Now I want you guys to see something here. I didn't do this on purpose, but this is a great example. You need to pay attention when you put your chuck on or anything on the headstock that it seats perfectly flat. On a previous video that you might have seen, I used magnets in a project. Well, guess what? <laughs> One of them somehow made it to my headstock and got between the bottom portion of the chuck and the headstock. Had I started turning with that, 
at a minimum, I would have had a lot of vibration in the lathe. It wouldn't have been good. You always want to make sure that the heads, the whatever you have mounted to the headstock seats perfectly flush. And you also saw in there, I have a plastic washer because this particular chuck, for whatever reason, doesn't seat all the way down. It, your chuck must seat all the way down on the headstock. If it doesn't, you can use a plastic spacer like you saw there. And I'll put a link to that in the description for this video. Okay, so I'm using my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. And I'm going to remove some of the material in the center of the bowl just to smooth this out. Okay, so as I'm working my way to the sidewall of this bowl, I'm repositioning the tool rest and I'm going to need to position myself across the tool, the completely across the lathe in order to make this cut. The bevel needs to be perfectly parallel with the exterior of the bowl and I need to hold it at a 90 degree angle so I don't get a kickback. So I want to make light cuts here. The nice thing about the live edge or natural edge bowl is you can see what you're doing because of the air between the walls. So here I'm lining up the bevel of the tool with the exterior of the bowl. Now as I proceed down into the bowl, I can't keep it perfectly parallel because there's more material there. So what I do is I come back and remove some of that material. It's almost like clearing out a ditch. This is why I turn from the outside in is for natural edge and live edge bowls. I've had some people comment and say, well, you know, if you're doing a thin bowl, you can just start from the inside and go all the way to the outside. And then you can just hold your hand up against the exterior and support that wood while you're making the thin final passes to prevent any vibration. And I gotta say, I'm not too thrilled with keeping my left hand out there on the exterior of this bowl while it's rotating, if it were a regular bowl even. Because if something comes loose, I'm gonna have a shard of wood most likely in my left hand. Now with a live edge or natural edge, unbalanced or organic shaped top edge, there's no way you can keep your hand up against that and support it. This is why I work from the wall out so that I can make nice thin walls and I have the support of the inner core of the bowl as I'm working down those walls. It's a real simple technique. It works for me. And again, like I, I teach on my website, turnawoodbowl.com is do what works for you. If you're comfortable working from the inside out and, and or if you want to put your hand on the outside of the bowl to support it while you're making thin bowls, then more power to you. Do what works for you. This is just the way I do it and the way I'm showing it. And you're welcome to do whatever works best for you. So what I'm doing here is I'm just nibbling away an area and I go up just a bit to merge the previous area with the new cleared area. I never go completely back up to the top. There's going to be vibration there and it's going to cause issues. If you saw there, as I moved back, I'm making a very light cut and I'm using the bevel right there just to kind of feel my way to where the high spot is and make a very light cut. Another big point that I want to make here is if you notice, I have the bowl gouge flute completely open. You want to be very careful with this because not at this particular moment. This is roughing, so this isn't so bad. But when you're making that cut on the outside wall with the flute open, you're only engaging a very small portion of the cutting edge to make the cut. If you get too aggressive with that, you're going to get a nasty catch. And if you go into the bottom of that ditch area, and you engage the other side of the gouge at the same time, you will also get a nasty catch. So you want to make light cuts, light passes when you're doing this. And again, this is removing that core material because we no longer need it. Now at this point, when I turn from the outside in, I will not return to the top of the bowl because it is vibrating. It is not turning smooth. I will not be able to get a clean cut there. I will hear a clacking sound if I get up there too high. 
Here's where I'm talking about the flute being very wide open. I'm closing the flute a bit by turning it to the side because it's becoming a deeper cut. But very open, very light cut. And as soon as I get to the other thick area, I slow down. I'm making very light passes here. The idea is that you want to sneak up on the thickness of the wall so that the bottom of the each portion that I'm working is going to be just a little bit thicker than the previous until I sneak up on it and match that new area with the previous area. And it needs to be very light passes so that you're, again, it's like you're sneaking up on it. Now, when I said before that the exterior of the bowl is the bowl, that's because it defines the shape, the look, the, everything about this bowl. So really all we're doing with the interior is matching it, matching the exterior. And we're trying to make the walls evenly thick or parallel to the exterior all the way down. When you go and find different pieces of wood to work with, don't be afraid of looking in all sorts of different different places. Bushes and shrubs, some of those trunks can be very large. And you, again, you don't need a very large piece to make a beautiful bowl. There you can see I'm just making a really light cut going backwards and just lightly picking up the previous area and then bringing it in and closing it off to finish off the bottom curve of the bowl. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and sand this. I'm going to sand it like I did the exterior. I'm going to go around this and sand Use the side of the pad to sand the grain and remove any tool marks. Remember, remove the tool marks as soon as you start sanding with your most, most coarse grit. I usually go from 120 or 180, and then I go to 240, 320, and then 400. And I'll go through all those grits, but the majority of the work is going to be done with my 120 or my 180 grit. I'm making sure that I've got all of the tool marks removed using that grit. You really don't want to sand with the lathe on with a piece this small and with the wings because it's going to cause that's going to cause some issues. You'll be smacking the wings of this and possibly breaking bark off. I can't believe the bark's still on this. That's, uh, <laughs> that was completely unexpected. But I do need to address those two areas where the bark was trying to come undone. That shouldn't be too difficult. We'll do that in just a second. All right, so there's that minor gap and the bark flex is there. I'm using Tight Bond 3, which is a really nice waterproof glue. Now, I don't want to get this all over in the grain of the wood, since it will potentially affect the finish. So I'm going to work really carefully just to get it down in that gap. I'm going to press it down in there. I've got to get that side too, but I'm going to finish this side first. I'm going to press it down in there, and I'm going to take a piece of 180 sandpaper, and I'm just going to sand that really fast. And ta-da, it's gone. <laughs> and now we've got some glue down there that's going to help bond that together so that it doesn't uh, separate over time. Although it went through this turning, so I don't know how it's going to separate. I guess if somebody were to play with it and pick on it, it would, it would separate. But I'm surprised that it was able to get through the turning without popping off. All right, well, that looked good. Very happy with that. So 
So now I'm going to change this out. I'm going to get my jam chuck. And then we're going to go ahead and turn the base of this. And make sure that seat's flat. I got to get rid of that magnet because I think it's stuck on my lathe still. <laughs> I don't want it coming back to the headstock and causing problems. Now this jam chuck has shifted a little bit and usually from being mounted and remounted to the chuck it's not going to turn perfectly smooth so what I'll do is I'll just quickly take off a little material on the end of this and there's plenty of material there and that way it'll be turning smooth. I'm also going to make the front of this a little bit flat. If, I, if it comes to a point it's only going to touch a, and connect a little bit with the inside of the bowl. However, if it's flat or almost concave on the front a little bit, it will engage more of the interior of the bowl. So I'm going to use a piece of foam padding and bring up the tailstock. Just need to match the previous tailstock point that's already on there. And then again, using my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge, I did this entire bowl with the, this gouge, except for the tenon, which I used the detailed spindle gouge to make that inside cut. But this one half inch gouge has created 99% of this bowl. All right, I'm gonna level off the foot. And then I'm going to make a slightly concave on the inside of this bowl. I'm going to take down the nub just a bit with this, and then I'm going to switch back over to my spindle detail gouge to get down inside there. The reason I go to the spindle detail gouge is because of the angle of the point, and the nose can get down into this, this crevice a little bit better. I'm going to pick up the curve here follow it all the way down to the bottom. And I'm going to continue to narrow that nub. It's kind of a tight space here and you want to be careful with your tool and what happened right there is I turned the tool around and engaged one of the wings and it scuffed up the foot of this so I need to fix that. I'm, I've got the nub down to almost nothing, but I'm going to go ahead and pick up and make another cut here just to take off that scratch mark. All right. I'm going to apply pressure and turn the lathe off and sever the nub right off the base. There's our bowl. It's looking pretty good. And then the little nub area that was left, you just basically use the edge of the sanding pad and you sand that down. I'll also flip this around and sand it from both directions so I don't accidentally have a create a groove or a rut with the sanding disc. And I'll go ahead and sign this. Now the nice thing about the jam chuck is you can use it to hold the bowl upside down, especially with a live edge bowl like this. I thought this was going to be a natural edge bowl, but this turned out to be a live edge bowl, so that's pretty cool. But with a live edge bowl like this, it's not easy to set this on a surface so that you can work the bottom of it like this. I'm using my chisel point and my wood burning tool. There are pin tools for signing with, but I like the chisel because my name has a lot of straight lines in it. So I use that the chisel point to get that nice crisp edges with it. All right, so now it's time for the finish. Because of the bark on this, I'm not going to use tried and true original. I'm using tried and true Danish oil. This is just boiled linseed oil. Now, it's important to know that when I say boiled linseed oil, that's a term that's used for a lot of Finnish companies. And when it's not accurate. Tried and true, in most cases, is not accurate. There may be some other companies out there, but none that I know of. Tried and true actually goes through a boiling process. 
And what that does is it polymerizes the, I think I'm saying that right, polymerizes the, the oil so that it will cure and protect the wood. But they do it in such a way that they don't use any chemicals, they don't use any metals, they don't use any additives when they're boiling their linseed oil. Some of most other manufacturers that have quote unquote linseed oil or quote unquote boiled linseed oil are using metal dryers that get added to the oil to finish it and you don't want that. Wow, look at that bowl. But to conclude, the reason I didn't use the original which has the beeswax in it is the beeswax can be difficult to get out of the bark and it can make the, the bark sticky and you don't want that. And the Danish oil does a beautiful job with this bowl. Look at those wood grains. I, uh, I can't believe these little scraps of wood could possibly go to waste or be discarded. Look at that. Those, those are tiny medullary rays. Those are grains or wood direction that goes from the center out. And you'll see those in certain types of, of wood. Look at that. Ah, I just, I love this piece. It turned out really, really nice. From yard waste to this, now, I got to tell you, this is pretty exciting. This was laying underneath a pile of smaller twigs and branches and leaves that could have easily been scooped up and mulched or worse, burnt. It, it kills me thinking that there's beautiful wood like this out there that's being discarded without ever being found or discovered. I mean, look how beautiful that is. This is not a great big log. You might easily overlook this. I know I had in the past, but I don't anymore. Now, the interesting thing about this is landscapers and gardeners like to use what they call specimen trees, which may or may not be indigenous to your area. Many times they plant these trees as a feature to be viewed in the middle of a garden or outside of a window for their flowers or their fruit or whatever. And those trees are, can be pretty special. You may not be finding these anywhere else, but they need to be trimmed up. And when they get trimmed up or taken out, you may be able to find some pieces of wood. The other great thing about this is you don't need a big piece of wood. This is about six inches wide or about 15 centimeters. Not huge, but look at the beautiful bowl that this created. So keep it in mind to pay attention when you're driving through areas where, especially where there's older neighborhoods with large trees and bushes, be paying attention for debris that's put out on the curb so that you might be able to pick up some beautiful discarded ditch wood that may be from a species you've never turned before. All right, guys, if you've liked this video, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen and subscribe if you're not already subscribing. Check out my website, turnawoodbull.com. And while you're there, click on the courses button at the top and check out the courses that I offer. I have a treatable understanding green wood course that goes over exactly what to do when you find beautiful wood like this, or if you need to cut down a bush or a tree, it, I'll show you exactly how to process that wood so you get the most from it and you don't get cracks. That's the worst. And, or the wood spoils and usually it spoils by cracking. So you can avoid all that when you have all the right information. So check out that course. I also have a great course on tool sharpening and how to turn wood bowls. Imagine that. All right, guys, we'll check those out at turnwoodbowl.com. And as always, until next time, happy turning.